Welcome to part three of the topic analysis on the September-October NSDA public forum debate topic, Resolved, the U.S. federal government ought to pay reparations to African Americans. This third and final installment is going to focus on the con side, in particular questions people had on the con side from the first one of these and from the first weekend of the year. So, going to go through a couple different con arguments people have asked me about and try to contextualize them in the larger picture of what con probably is or isn't trying to prove in this round. So, the first argument I got asked about was this question of moral obligations. Can or can't the federal government have a moral obligation? And there are a couple different flavors of this argument. One that says governments can't have moral obligations at all. One that says governments can only have moral obligations to other governments but not to their people, and one that says ought means obligation in the context of individuals, but not in the context of governments. So the first one of these works best if your opponents define ought as moral obligation. If you define ought as moral obligation, and then say governments can't have moral obligations, then under your interpretation, the resolution is meaningless. So you probably want to let Pro do half of the work for you there. The second one is a little stronger regardless of who defines it how. You can agree that moral obligations exist, and therefore that any topic that contains the words United States federal government and ought doesn't become meaningless, but that in this context, we have to look at contractual obligations to society as a whole before moral obligations to one subgroup. The third category isn't really a reason to reject the resolution in and of itself, but it can be a useful springboard for other arguments and a useful way to weigh things going forward into the round. As such, it tends to be more of a framework than a contention of its own. Another question I got is just about the various arguments all of which together collectively argue that reparations won't really fix anything, that there will still be problems. Some of these just identify an unfixable root cause and try to put fixing that as the burden on pro. Others of these just show various barriers to particular kinds of reparations solving. If you run an argument like this, you need to be sure that it shows that reparations cannot fix everything, or that they cannot fix anything. Pro will argue they just need to show that reparations make things better, not best, but better than they are right now, and that doing nothing makes things worse than doing something. At that point, you need to be able to show this something inherent to reparations, intrinsic to whatever the pro tries to do. Because otherwise, it is a reason not to do a particular kind of reparations, or a reason to do reparations in a different way, but it's not a reason that we don't have an obligation to try something so much as narrowing down what that something is. So if you are going to make arguments about reparations won't make things better, they need to not be, this author says that some of the time reparations may not make things better, but there is something about the nature of reparations that means they will make things worse. Another argument that I've heard asked about a lot in terms of the framing question is, if ought implies can, does can't imply ought not? Maybe. It probably depends, well, I mean, first of it really depends on who drops what in the round, but in a round where it is argued evenly, it probably depends on why one can't do something. So if I have an obligation that I ought to be at a tournament by registration, and I make bad choices, and I stay late, and I leave late, and I get stuck in traffic, and I can't be there, I still ought to be there. If it would have always been physically impossible for me to go, if I knew that I wouldn't be there that weekend, then I could say, well, I can't be there, maybe I ought not be there, but it comes down to whether or not the choices one made decide whether or not they can't do something. So even if you can do something, that doesn't necessarily mean you're obligated to try, but if you can't do something, you may still be obligated to try, depending on why it is you can't do it. So for instance, if I say that the government can't pay reparations because of some other factor beyond their control, like some degree of bias in humanity is inevitable, that's probably not an argument why they don't need to try. But if Pro is able to show that the can't is something the government caused, 
then their argument becomes stronger. So you need to frame this argument in the context of this is something either beyond the government's control or something that pro set up themselves in their definition. And a primary example of this would be pro teams that go overboard in the 13th Amendment contention and argue that the government is still doing these same problems, that the harms are ongoing in the status quo with no sign of stopping and no hint of remorse, at which case the reason we can't pay reparations isn't just because it's impractical, but because the resolution is in the present tense and stopping is a prerequisite to paying reparations. And at that point, the argument can become stronger. Generally speaking, though, this argument, again, relies on 100% defense. You have to show that there's genuinely no way we possibly could. If there is a risk of either argument, this doesn't play out too well for the con side. That kind of leads into another more flexible form of con argument in terms of these aren't real reparations, those things that you're doing don't count as reparations, and that can be run against a variety of pro cases, and I think it's a fairly solid argument, especially against replenish pro teams, albeit one that requires you to be flexible. If you are a con team and you have specific answers to why vouchers aren't reparations, to why more money into preschools aren't reparations, to why Section 8 housing isn't reparations, to why affirmative action isn't paying reparations, and you define pay reparations too collectively, you can rule out a lot of pro cases fairly easily. And a lot of pro teams are getting caught up in trying to show solvency by picking particular obscure plans that are fairly easy to defend, but not actually looking at the bigger picture. And if that happens, and you can show that everything they're advocating for is not a reparation, then it forces them to pretty much start over from ground zero later in the round, which you can certainly beat them on if your contentions are applicable to any kind of reparation, and they're just starting to defend the idea of reparations in their later speeches. I think that you can also talk about the idea of that we have to look at the effects here, and Pro will say, no, we don't, we should just look at the justification and maybe that's true if it could backfire, but if it will backfire, then we do have to look at the effects. This is kind of backlash in the context of the can't versus ought not distinction that I spent a couple minutes on before. Similarly, you can see another expression of that and kind of the idea of, well, we can't afford to. And this is a con argument that will have more or less play in different circuits with different kinds of judges, depending on how policy oriented they are depending on how debate experience they are, but if you just say, we can't afford to do this, then that can be a question of trade-offs or that can be a question of inflation. Khan does not get to pick how reparations would be paid. Prosible needs to defend that we ought to pay them somehow, but Khan can usually narrow this down to either they will trade off with other government spending or they will force us to print new money and there will be harms to inflation. Now, obviously, the inflation debate is one that has turns on both sides that can be read, but a con team that comes prepared for it can often show that with enough damage to the economy, even the people the government is giving money to will have less overall purchasing power after the resolution than before, and therefore what the government is doing is not necessarily helping. At that point, it's pretty easy for the con team to go ahead and outweigh the benefits if the pro team is willing to talk about it forward-looking, and if the pro team isn't willing to talk about it forward-looking, then at that point, it's really just going to be that framework debate anyway, but you've pretty much got a guaranteed win on the substance if you can win the framework. Again, though, I would not recommend having just contentions that accept, okay, well, we have an obligation to, but it would be impractical to fulfill it, so it's wrong. Probably have one pre-implementation and one post-implementation argument at the very least. Give yourself two ways to win the round as the con team. So another con argument that's on my list people asked about was the idea of whitewashing history. The idea of reparations will say, okay, it's over, it's done with, we're even now, and that will actually stop all future progress and eliminate a sense of guilt that might be important to implementing future policies. Personally, not a fan of this argument. I think that it's empirically untrue with other past reparations. I think it's hard to prove uniqueness on in terms of whether or not history is being whitewashed already. I think that even if you show 
that reparations will make some people think that we're even now, that this is an argument against basically any kind of reparations at any point in the future when the impact of the argument is being able to do more things to even this out in the future. And if you can only pick one program, then you need an offensive reason why it should not be reparations if anything you do to improve this is going to cause the same effect. Now, some kind of teams were talking about running this by saying, so do this, but don't call it reparations. I don't think that changes the actual question of the resolution, which is whether or not the reparations are owed, not whether or not it's better to spin them and package them as something other than reparations, if they are still what is owed in the first place. And that takes us to the backlash arguments. And generally speaking, if you're talking about causing backlash, you're talking about causing backlash either within the group or without the group. If you're causing backlash within the group, you're talking about the African American community having backlash to reparations itself. This is sometimes done in terms of talking about internalized racism. This is sometimes done in talking about spurring community infighting, as some people want to accept reparations, some people want to reject them. This argument is probably the easier one to run, but the harder one to weigh. The other argument tends to do more with backlash against this and really runs into uniqueness problems on two levels. First off, just the idea that it is extremely non-unique in terms of backlash is already ongoing in the status quo. Second off, just in terms of how that uniqueness compares to the link, because I am not sure who there is that is actually going to become upset because of reparations, but isn't upset already, who isn't already backlashing because of other things. And it's really hard for a con team to show in a wayable way who the new people are who are going to be made upset. And con teams have tried to do this a couple ways. Some teams do it by talking about, well, this was an increase in hate crimes, and that will necessarily cost lives, which means the government can't do it. For con teams to run this backlash argument, they need to find evidence that says, look, I have nothing against trying to improve the law of African Americans, but if we give them this, then it will cause backlash, and that backlash will cause violence, and I don't want their blood on my hands, and for their own good, we need to deny them this. And that evidence definitely exists. The trouble is that a lot of it was written in the late 1950s and early 1960s as a response to the Civil Rights Act. And that in and of itself kind of shows the uniqueness problem that arises here. Probably a stronger cousin to that same argument is the idea of preventing better progress. And this can be broken down into political capital, political will, losing motivating guilt, or undermining multiracial coalitions. And these arguments can break down in a couple of different ways. I think the political will and political capital arguments are weaker arguments, and I think that part of why that is has to do with public forums' confusion regarding fiat. This is an ought topic, and we're asking what the government should do. It's kind of weird to say these people who are in government right now will never vote for reparations, but they ought to. But if they did, they would backlash against themselves for voting for reparations and force themselves to vote for other things in exchange. That's not how political capital works even in policy debate, which isn't how political capital works in actual political theory, which isn't how political capital works in real life, but that is another story entirely. The trouble with this is that if you base it off of political capital, then you need an impact or something else that is better to do but is not a counterplan. That we should save this so we can cause more progress in another way. And you also, in this case, need to win that waiting is not going to cost us progress, that waiting is not going to make things worse. This is an argument that concedes a lot of the pro case and pushes back in a place that Khan doesn't have a whole ton of offense. The same is kind of true for the white guilt argument. I think that if you make that argument, when the guilt goes away, that relies on you winning discourse arguments on reparations that you may not have the cards to win. 
I think that the pro team is pretty well equipped to argue that past reparations have not made us forget about the atrocities that they were paid for, and that even if people did have a little bit less guilt, that maybe guilt isn't the right motivating factor to consider in an ought topic anyway. The last of these categories of preventing better progress is probably the most intriguing one for con teams to run, and that's the idea of how this deals with coalitions. There are a lot of authors who say that multiracial coalitions stick together best when they work for things that don't benefit any one race. Things that maybe try to target white supremacy rather than targeting xenophobia or targeting anti-blackness or targeting any other sentiment that happens to go against one particular group, but trying to target discrimination as a whole and equality as a whole. In not necessarily an entirely colorblind way, but in a multicultural, intersectional way at the very least. So for instance, the idea that we should have laws that try and prevent discrimination, rather than laws that try and make black people harder to discriminate against. That we should have laws that increase educational opportunity for everyone, rather than laws that specifically try to narrow the black-white educational gap. And that when coalitions focus on these kinds of things, they find success, but when one member of the coalition gets a large concession for just them, the coalition falls apart. This is an argument that is not really a counterplan so much as an opportunity cost, but that implies that in a dynamic status quo, coalitions have made and are making progress that they can only make if they stick together, and that focusing on single race issues right now is not necessarily the right way to do this because it will cost us progress on issues that affect all races at once and allow more net progress for not just African Americans, but all minorities. And this doesn't necessarily just mean racial minorities. This can also talk about coalitions involving people who are discriminated against because of gender, because of sexuality, because of religion, etc. So I think that if you are going to talk about reparations prevent better progress, coalitions are probably the way to go. It is certainly an argument that has a lot of pro answers. I think that if you are going to run it on con, you need to be able to explain why coalitions haven't fallen apart already, or why they won't inevitably fall apart, and talk about it less in terms of this is a binary will or won't happen scenario, so much as a sliding scale of one side will have fewer coalitions that make less effective progress, and cause fewer minority rights overall, and the other side will have more coalitions that make more progress and reduce the need for reparations in the first place and end up leaving a better situation for everyone involved. Another argument that con teams are running is the idea that the USFG is not morally culpable. Some people voted against reparations, some people weren't around for them, some people's ancestors weren't around for them, some people's ancestors fought against slavery. This is a reason why citizens aren't culpable. I'm not sure why it necessarily applies to the government. When the government paid reparations for Japanese internment, even Americans who opposed Japanese internment were taxpayers, and their taxes went into those reparations as well. Even immigrants who came to this country long after slavery ended came here in large part because of the strong economy America has, which was, in many ways, built on the things that pros are going to be paying reparations for. I think that showing that various individuals don't have culpability doesn't address whether the government ought to pay the reparations in the first place. A similar sibling to this argument is the idea that we're not culpable because we have paid reparations already. And there are good and bad ways to run this argument. Even the good ways, I'm not sure, make it worth one of two or three slots in a con case. Saying welfare is reparations is probably not going to make you very many friends. Saying affirmative action is reparations, even if that were true, and it certainly could be. People discussed affirmative action as reparations when it was originally implemented. It's not necessarily something that's being paid to somebody. And even if it were, it's reparations with an S, and it's not an argument against future reparations. So at that point, I think that the one remaining way that con teams might get away with is the idea of we paid reparations, 
for something that can't be measured in money with something else that can't be measured in money, with 330,000 deaths during the Civil War to end slavery. And that in and of itself helped pay, helped atone. Now, there are certainly some problems with this argument that can come up as well, which is why I said I'm not sure it's really worth a slot in a con case, so much as maybe in response if a pro team talks about it. First off, I don't know if the government can take credit for people choosing to sacrifice their own lives. That's probably those people doing something, not the government. Second off, that doesn't cover reparations for anything that happened discriminatory after the Civil War. Third off, a decent chunk of the Union soldiers who died during the Civil War were African American, and I don't know if you can count those as reparations the federal government paid towards African Americans. I think that in circuits where you have a lot of lay judges and where patriotism runs high, you can certainly get away with this argument on com, but I don't think that it is logically the strongest argument. Now we get into the legal arguments. So this idea of ex post facto, this idea of sovereign immunity, this idea of Tenth Amendment distribution of powers, and this idea of the government just otherwise being not liable. So let's look at these. In terms of ex post facto, I think that Khan is barking up the wrong tree with this. I think this might be able to be part of a block on relevant pro contentions, but overall, I think that if Khan talks for ex post facto, that doesn't change the fact that other things the US government has paid reparations for, with the exception of broken treaties to indigenous tribes, were things that were legal at the time. Furthermore, the whole point of reparations, according to many definitions that pro teams will read, is that they are paid for things that were okay at the time, but we have since learned were wrong. Aside from that, sovereign immunity is a reason the government can choose not to pay reparations. Pro is simply going to say they ought not exercise sovereign immunity in this case, and that argument simply proves that in the status quo, proponents of reparations would not win a legal case. It does not mean that the government ought to decide that it doesn't have to pay reparations. Beyond that, the Tenth Amendment arguments generally rely on a misunderstanding of how that actually applies and how it's evolved since, oh, say, Marbury versus Madison, and perhaps more relevantly, Sherman v. Georgia. The Tenth Amendment has changed a lot since it was originally written, and under that particular argument, there would be a lot of other things the government couldn't make redress for that it already has. So aside from that, there's the idea of just strict scrutiny, that the Fourth Amendment prohibits singling out any one race positively or negatively, and that doing so would violate the Fourteenth Amendment. The trouble with this is strict scrutiny doesn't mean you can't do it. It means you need to prove a compelling state interest, which means that you're right back where you started, where Pro has contentions that try and prove a compelling state interest, and you try to prove that there is not. This can be useful for making the debate effects-based if it's not already, but if it already is, it's not going to really gain you anything unless you show that the Pro contentions are true, in which case you've already won the debate anyway. That takes us to a couple more critical arguments that people have been asking about. And for the record, Public Forum defines critiques as off-topic arguments. There is a difference between running a K, which has a link, an implication, and an alternative, and criticizing the other team's arguments. The latter is legitimate in any kind of debate, no matter what, especially you can link it directly into the resolution like you really can here. So one of the arguments that's probably going to cross over from other forms of debate is this concept of Afro-pessimism. There is a lot to it, but for now, the important thing to understand is that many con teams that run it are going to argue that this is not a conflict, it is an antagonism. And the difference is that an antagonism is really functionally irreconcilable. That what you'd be paying reparations for is something can never actually be undone, that it's not really just about lost labor, but that it is more about kind of a lost identity, a lost place in society, a lost value, this whole idea of complete alienation, and that no amount of reparations is ever going to fix that. So sure, we can do things to try and make it better, but we shouldn't do them as reparations, because reparations aren't ever going to actually fix this kind of exclusion from civil society. And that's where those kind of arguments generally get run. Another argument like this is the idea of spectacular blackness, the idea that the pro team 
is just using exploitative scenes of black suffering to try and persuade people for their own personal benefit rather than to actually do anything meaningful, rather than actually caring about what's being done to the people. That it's really just a way to exploit people who have already been exploited even further, and that this shouldn't be rewarded with a ballot, and that pro teams should have to actually show meaningful ways that they will give black people a place in civil society, which, according to the previous argument, they may or may not even be able to do. So, at that point, the idea becomes not so much that we shouldn't do something as that what we are doing cannot possibly go far enough as to be called reparations without lying, so the resolution is not true. The last argument in this vein is the idea of critical race theory, that we really shouldn't be defining race, that the government shouldn't be in the position of deciding who is and isn't African American. I think this, again, is probably better as a block than as an argument of itself. I think that Pro has a lot of fairly ready-made answers to it that sound persuasive. I think that it's something Khan can present as a block to effective reparations, but that, again, it doesn't actually rule out reparations so much as say that if we were to give reparations, we would have to be really careful about how we did this, and it's not a reason simply to not give them at all. Briefly, there are some other con arguments that I have seriously heard and on some circuits have met with success. We shouldn't give reparations because they are better off. We shouldn't give reparations because it will make them lazy. They don't need reparations. We have a black president. Reparations will make people racist versus white people, etc. If you're able to win with any of these arguments on your local circuit, you really don't need any kind of advice. You really just get to win by virtue of not being pro, so I'm not going to go into those too much here. I don't think that winning on those arguments will make you a better debater, because if those arguments win at all, they are only going to win in front of a judge who wasn't going to vote pro no matter what. So at that point, you're probably better off if you want to be a better debater in the months after October, running arguments that actually engage with the pro team and will help with a judge who doesn't have a bias either way on this resolution. And that's really all I have to say about those. Let me know if you have any other questions, and I will try and answer in the comments. Other than that, stay tuned for the November topic coming out October 1st.